So we talk about hypothesis testing in our regressions and how heteroscedasticity will change that. So, you know, we're often going to be doing hypothesis testing, and one of the first things to talk about is the distinction between, you know, doing a t-test on an individual uh, regression coefficient versus doing a usually f-test on all of the regression or a set of regression coefficients taken together. So in the univariate regression, you know, we just y regressed on x1, then the t-test on significance is the same as the f-test that says, hey, are all the x variables jointly different from zero because all of them is the one of them, so you know that's pretty simple. If there's a multivariate regression, which is usually the case, then the f-test is testing on whether all of the slope coefficients are each and every one of them is zero, right? If that's a, if or alternately saying, is there evidence that they're not all together zero? You know, remember from the you know our pictures back in the OLS case, you know, a zero slope on the regression line just says there's no relationship between x and y. You know, y is has values up and down, x has values left and right, but you know there's no particular relationship there so that would be a zero slope on the and you know again in multi dimensions the zero slope at least uh, generalizes there you know so we can have different tests we can test whether a group of beta uh, coefficients are all equal to zero or again if we wanted we can think, test if they're all equal to some other number um, but that's going to be different then testing is just one of them, zero. Or like I said, sometimes a set of coefficients. You know, for instance, if we have a bunch of dummy variables for education, you know, we might want to test, well, is education overall, you know, how fine-grained we uh, divide it, you know, or is education overall significant? Or... And so, you know, we have this linear hypothesis is the little function in R to do that, and you know you can explore that at your own pace. You know, so I mean, let's think about the basic idea of how these tests are set up. You know, the OLS regression is trying to minimize the sum of squared errors, right? It's choosing coefficients, choosing beta coefficients to make the sum of squared errors as small as we can possibly get it. Um, if I add one or more x variables, then the error is certainly going to get, it's not going to increase. It's going to get go down, typically. Um, but how much down? You know, is, is it going to go down by a big amount? Or is it going to go down by just a little amount? And, you know, the classic statistician's formulation, you know, McCloskey's phrase is, how big is big? Right? Is there a big difference in the sum of squared errors between two models where one has more x variables in it? Um, the other way an economist might put it is, you know, is adding more x variables has a marginal cost. How large is the marginal benefit? Right? And again, rational decision making will have to trade off on marginal benefit and marginal cost. Um, you know, now adding variables makes the error smaller, dropping variables makes the error bigger. I mean, you can kind of think of, you know, either direction there. Now we're assuming we have nested models, right? That the, typically when we're doing this, you're, you know, have, so you have the same y variable. Um, you know, this doesn't much help if you're doing slight differences in y variable, like, you know, if you're changing the units or you know, doing some more complicated things. But like I said, it's often done for like sets of dummy variables. Um, and again, the final thing I will keep coming back to because I know everybody tends to forget it at various times what we're doing. Statistical significance is not the identical thing to important. It's quite possible that things either maybe are important even if they're not statistically significant or vice versa. They may be statistically significant but unimportant in lots of other ways. So, you know, again, don't get too confused over just because we have lots of nice mathematics about statistical significance. We do not have nearly so much about 
well, what is actually important? That's much more about your judgment. But, you know, we can think about where these formulas are coming from. Um, you know, so if we're minimizing the sum of squared errors, then we can, or sometimes called sum of squared residuals, and I believe the textbook uses that, uh, S, the SSR. Um, you know, that's the, each error is y minus the beta hat values times x, and so the sum of those squared residuals is just the sum of the squared residuals. Um, we'll assume we have SSR naught and SSR one, um, where model zero has fewer variables, so it's gonna have a bigger error. And you know the we can find, well, what is the percent change in the sum of squared residuals? And so that is, in some sense, the benefit. We want to basically calculate the elasticity, right? There's the percent change in the sum of squared residuals. We're going to divide that by the percent change in the number of x variables. So, you know, we have the model naught has n minus k minus 1 degrees of freedom. The model 1 has q more uh, variables, and so q fewer degrees of freedom. So the percent change in degrees of freedom is given there, and when we divide one percent change by the other percent change, and that gives us an F statistic, which, you know, is... Now, I'm then going to back off and say, well, that's only if I have homoscedastic errors. In the presence of heteroscedasticity, that formula is going to get ugly, more complicated, just generally ugly. Um, so what is the point of doing that formula? The point of doing that formula is just kind of remind yourself that it's what we're basically doing is some sort of elasticity type calculation. Again, if you, you know, back in micro class, you know, like Echo 100 or whatever, you probably did some elasticity calculations and, you know, they can kind of look a little ugly when you first see that giant formula with like, you know, nested uh, uh, ratios there. But again, if you just break it down to the simple steps, it is just the sort of elasticity calculation that we're pretty accustomed to using in econ economics. Now, heteroscedasticity is extraordinarily common. Um, you know, so this is the idea that in regression line, for some values of x, the um, errors, the distribution of the errors around the regression line are wider or narrower. Sort of the classic case is if I look at um, the wages of people as they get older, they tend to spread out more. You know, the recent college grads tend to get, you know, pretty, there's not a tremendous amount of variation. You know, if you're, depending on your major, depending on, you know, relatively small set of vari variables, um, you know, your wage is going to be pretty clearly defined. But then as people get older, you know, the, over their, so the span of their career, you know, some people tend to really see, see significant increases, other people do not. So that gives heteroscedasticity. There's more of a spread as people get older, which, again, if I say that older people tend to spread out more, you might think around the waistline, and I was just talk, well, you know, talk about that, but, you know, also in terms of their, yeah, wage around their regression line. Um, but, again, heteroscedasticity can come in many, many different forms. You know, that's just one example. Um, you know, the so, you know, reeling back, so the Stock Watson textbook always uses what are called heteroscedasticity consistent errors. Sometimes um, the people that developed this, not always working together, were Iker, Huber, and White. And so, you know, sometimes you hear one or some of those names together or all of them together. You know, it has a lot of different um, possible names. Sometimes people also use HAC which is heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation consistent errors, uh, sometimes called Newey West errors. I mean, the, the nomenclature is just a mess, as well as, I mean, the formulas are a mess, the nomenclature is a mess, but, you know, it's at least pretty straightforward to do it in R, and 
you know, I'd recommend you make a habit of doing that every time. So it's the simple, you know, COIF test with variance, covariance, um, heteroscedasticity correction. That's the V of HC part of it. Um, with all these, the coefficient estimates do not change, but the standard errors do change. It allows the standard errors to change more. And so, right, if you remember the list, the coefficient estimates don't change, the standard errors do change. So that is going to change the T stats and change the P values. Um, so usually the standard errors are going to increase. So, you know, and you should be able to by now have the intuition settled that as the coefficient doesn't change, the standard error goes up, and the T value goes down, and so the P value goes up. And if you haven't got each of those steps settled in your mind, then make sure you go back and make sure that it is more settled, because you know that's an important part of the understanding that we're trying to develop here.